Okay, there we are. Oops, sorry. Okay. A very good evening to all of you who are joining us today evening, Sunday evening. We're going to utilize it in a wonderful sort of way because here we are with the famous, very famous, whoever I know who lives in Shimla and who's been to Shimla and who knows about Shimla knows Raja Bhaseen. And uh, I've been wanting to invite you on this forum and I'm so glad it finally happened. Um, a little bit about Raja Bhaseen. Uh, he's been educated at Bishop Cotton, Bishop Cotton School, Shimla, and the Punjab University, Chandigarh. He's published 15 critically acclaimed and award-winning books and 2,000 articles, stories, and reviews in various leading publications in India and abroad. And I do want to say, you know, I'm a member of this WhatsApp group uh, for Kulu and Manali called Crazy Mountain Goats. And it so happened that I was just... Uh, ping went my uh, phone and I saw and somebody was writing, does anybody have Raja Bhaseen's number because we are visiting Shimla and we would love to meet and I was like, I was, you know, with all um, with the confidence and I was so proud, I put the flyer up, I said, here he is, he's coming on a forum to give a talk and I will ask him for his number. <laughs> so I was really, really happy that, you know, the time was so, um, it was so coincidental that you're coming on a forum and people are asking about you all over the Himalayas and uh, everywhere else. Um, because the way Raja Bhaseen knows the mountains, it's um, up close and personal. And uh, today's talk is all about that. You know, it'll be like a conversational thing where he'll be talking about his life and working in the Himalayas. And um, so many of us during the pandemic have um, realized that city life is not what it used to be. Uh, and we are all wanting to go to the mountains and inundate it with our, uh, you know, print. <laughs> and uh, if you so want to do it, you need to know about people who are already living there, who love the mountains, who live there, who, 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 who are just a part of this beautiful range that we have, right? So more about him, his writing, it covers history, travel, fiction, and poetry. He's handled prestigious assignments for various organizations, which include the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, the Indian Army, International Market Assessment, and various departments of the Government of India and the Himachal State Government, travel and hospitality companies. He does carry out heritage walks. So, uh, Shimla is just filled with the past, just filled with the past. You talk about the, um, um, uh, the past about the deities or uh, the British past and uh, the by lanes of mem going down memory lane of Shimla. Well, you have to go to him. He's worked extensively with television channels like the BBC, Channel 4, Nat Geo, Discovery. He's a well-known speaker and he's given TED Talks and he's also the co-convener for Himachal Pradesh with Intac and remains involved in heritage, conservation of heritage, which is so, so important. And of course, if you're in the Himalayas, you do trek and uh, Shimla is known for its theater as well. And um, so over to him and all that he does so wonderfully for the Himalayas living in Shimla. So with that, let me just put the first question. Tell us about your childhood and how you landed up in the Himalayas. And uh, we'll, we'll just go forward in a flow and we'll just have this conversation going. Well, thank you, Sonali. Thank you for all that with all those rather flattering words. It's a little difficult to live up to all that in real life. It's all very nice to have it all flowery, but <laughs> the reality sometimes is just plain old hard work. So Sonali, the, the family connection is with Simla and the Himalayas is actually relatively limited. My dada, my grandfather, uh, was one of the first Indians to become a professor at the old Punjab University in Lahore, which was in the late uh, part of the, uh, the 19th century. And uh, his brother, uh, Bihari Lal Bhuseen, was also an educationist, but was more involved with trying to spread 
education across the Punjab. And both were at one point of time very active Arya Samaj members. My grand uncle Bihari Lal, my grandfather's brother, had somehow become connected with uh, Samuel Stokes, the man who brought the apples to India. Though I should add, I'll add a little bit about Samuel Stokes later. And interestingly enough, my grand uncle under Stokes' influence uh, converted to Christianity. But when Stokes converted to Hinduism in his later years and changed his name from Samuel to Satyanand, my grand uncle also reverted back to Hinduism. They were very close. And uh, from Lahore, my grand uncle would travel up to Kotgar, where uh, Samuel Stokes was setting up a small school. So that school, my grand uncle was helping him to set up. And my father, as a seven-year-old child in the 1920s, would travel up with his uncle. They would come from Lahore to Simla by train, and then it would take them roughly about three days to walk, and between riding on mules and uh, walking, it would take them about three days from Simla going up to Kotkar. So a little bit of my father's childhood he had seen up in Kotkar. However, it's only after the partition of our country, because the family was based at Lahore, it's only after the partition of the country, because my father had two simultaneous careers. One, he was teaching at the old government college in Lahore, and he was also helping the Punjab government set up the Punjab, uh, uh, the Punjab Educational Films Department. Now, after partition, the Films Department came to this side of the border, to Jalandhar first, to sorry, to Ludhiana first. And then from Ludhiana, it moved to, uh, it moved to uh, Solon. And then from Solon, it came up to Simla. Oddly enough, at uh, all that point of time, uh, when the, his, the department was finally to move out of Simla and go to Delhi, my father left his job because he loved, he had fallen in love with this town. So he left his job and continued with teaching. So we grew up and he married here, as I mentioned, uh, we've got a similar ancestry from a similar place in what is now Pok, uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, a town called Mirpur. So my mother came from there and they were married here in Simla in 1957. I was born in 61. So my father was in teaching. I studied at Bishop Cotton where he joined to teach because I had to go to school, if you please. And a lot of my childhood was simply spent running around these hills. The population was sparse. The town was still, I would say, beautifully preserved, almost into a sense of isolation. And uh, in many ways, the 50s, the 60s, and the early 70s would perhaps have been the best time to have been in a town like Simla. The racial divide and the snobbishness of the Raj was all over. It was still preserved in a, in a perfect time lock, in a manner of speaking. Many of the old lifestyles were still there. It is post this period, after Simla becomes a, the capital of Himachal Pradesh, and Himachal Pradesh's pace of development starts accelerating, that major changes have started coming into the hills, some for the better, some for the worse. Uh, well, that's my childhood spent. Uh, we would be, we, when we went out walking and trekking, we never carried water with us. We would drink from streams. We would gather twigs, and I'm talking as an 11, 12-year-old child, or maybe even younger. We would gather twigs, we would light a fire, we would make tea or coffee boiling milk, uh, cooking a little bit terribly, I may add, or eating whatever we had brought with us. It was a very free, a very safe, and a very, I would say, a childhood, which in many ways one would say was idyllic, uh, whether it was running around, walking in these hills, learning about trees and plants, which 
in many ways, we never learned in a formal classroom structure. Today, if one knows a little bit, okay, this is a bit too booty, this is a stinging nettle. You knew it because you got stung. Nobody told you about it. You knew that the dock leaf, the jungli palak kapata, was its antidote. And you came to know that is because one was acidic and the other was alkaline and neutralized it. But this was all done through personal experience. Then in little empty jam jars from the streams, we'd carry up these tiny fish. The poor things died in a couple of days, but we still had to bring them home and uh, put them into our wash basins, uh, much to the despair of our parents. But it was, uh, it was amazing in so many ways. And uh, then whether it was skating, going ice skating, I started ice skating when I was two and a half. I could, must have been barely walking at that point. So we had these double skates. So you actually, which you get very good double skates now. At that time, it was simply a very crude, like a double blade thing, which was strapped onto a shoe and off you went. Whether it was that, whether it was uh, skiing, which I managed to, to do with the greatest difficulty, but it was wonderful. And the thing was, the most important thing is we didn't have gadgets. And uh, here, let me share a small little incident, a very personal incident. Mm -hmm. When my older son, who's now in his 20s, he was a small child. I was talking to him, you know, that, oh, we didn't have a TV. There was no internet. There, there was no this, there was no that. And we'd sit in front of the fire and your grandfather, my father, would read to us. He understood that part of things. You didn't have this. You didn't have this. You didn't have this. He says, what's a fire? The child had never seen uh, an open fire. The only fire he knew of was the stuff in, on which was the gas uh, fire uh, of a kitchen. So I said, okay, this is not on for a hill child. So after years and years and years, we started relighting our fires at home. Because it's if you have a hill existence, there's some very basics which you really must grow up with. They become an intrinsic part of your childhood. Um, my sister, who's seven or eight years younger than me, uh, she, well, she lives in the US now. And for year, all her happiest memories are growing up in the hills. And even now, like she goes up, if she goes up into upstate New York or into Vermont, her thing is how like Simla is this? The benchmark is the Himalaya, the benchmark is Simla. You know, it's so true that you talk about the benchmarks that even when I when, when in Los Angeles, I'm always uh, calculating distances, not in miles, but I'm saying, oh, how far, as far as it is from Chandigarh to Kullu to Shimla, you know, <laughs> those are my benchmarks. So it's um, carrying memories. And what you were talking about, Fai, I remember many years ago when I went to Kashmir, I got the Kangri. Yeah. And I really wanted to see it light. And, you know, you're supposed to wear it under the firans, right? But I wore it under my sweater and I'm talking to one of my friends. And suddenly I said, I can smell fire. And then I suddenly saw myself and I said, oh my God, I am on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So reliving your, you know, things that you've heard about, but um, experiencing that. And that's the most wonderful part of, you know, you having uh, been born there and being raised there. And you've seen, you are a witness to the change. You are that bridge between the past, the present and the future. Yeah. So tell us, Tell us a little bit about um, uh, this transformation that you have seen. Uh, how, how do you envision the future? And of course, um, the future, sometimes you feel it's not that bright, especially after the pandemic, but I'm sure you're hopeful about a lot many things. Tell us a few of those things that have still continued. You know, I want you to talk about continuity and a change mm. in um, whatever you have experienced. One is that, um... When we look at development and we look at progress, there have, they will, at the very basic of a, a point of this will be, you will have to have two viewpoints. One is of the developer and one is so to say of the developee for want of a better word. Now, if the people of Spiti say, this is as a random example, want a road to connect to their village, 
And we also know that that road is going to create severe ecological damage. What do you do? What is your choice? Are you going to uh, hold judgment that no, they should not have a road, they should not have a better life, they should not have a greater facilities? You have to, the bottom line for this entire exercise is always balance, which goes for just about everything in anybody's life. The moment you disturb the balance is when you're asking for trouble. Now one learns that from the Kiratpur Kullu Highway is planned now as a more modern bridge and tunnel highway, which is the way perhaps it would have been the way to do even this one, the Kalka Simla Highway. Now the Kalka Simla Highway, to my mind, is an ecological disaster. It is one of the most stupid things to have been done anywhere in the country. You have cut about 60,000 trees uh, to make this road. It could have been the bridge and tunnel uh, system. And what have you done? You brought a four lane highway, gradually narrowing down like a funnel to create a traffic, a choked traffic at the very outskirts of Simla. There are times it takes us an hour to an hour and a half from uh, literally a, a kilometer and a half from our house to get, uh, get into town because the traffic is choked, the roads cannot handle it. Now, is, does this make sense? Making a parking uh, miles outside town where nobody wants to park or cannot park, there has to be practicality to everything. And without that practicality, what do we end up doing? We end up actually destroying something, which is something which I very strongly feel we, we, we do not treat ourselves as custodians. We are custodians for a particular time frame. Add something, don't remove something. As a custodian, you must keep adding to it. If you are adding development, it must be added at a cost which is not to the environment. The environment is permanent. That is uh, a given. That having been said, over the years, Himachal has progressed tremendously. From a backward poverty written state, it is today at the forefront of most states in our country. Whether we are looking at primary education, whether we are looking at literacy, whether we are looking at primary health care, whether we are looking at quality of life, the kind of poverty which we will see in other parts of the country does not exist in Himachal. There is also the hard, bitter truth behind it is if you do not have food and shelter, the cold will kill you, you're dead, uh, the matter's over. So, but that ha again, having been said, the government has taken enormous developmental uh, factors into this. And the way Himachal has progressed is tremendous. To give you an example, uh, when India, long before India got the independence, this is the census of either 1921 or 1926. I'm not very sure in which year this was held. The life expectancy at birth in our country was 19 years, which is absurd. Today, we are at a national average of 67 years. Not so great in terms of, say, the other rest of the world, but and Himachal is at 69 years. The quality of life, it may not be so rich in terms of money or whatever, but the richness and the quality of life which one will have in the hills and mountains is far better than what you would have in the cities. Again, to get uh, give it a very personal touch, uh, we were in Delhi and uh, at a home in Delhi, and uh, I got the Delta variant of COVID, as did my sons. So. As soon as we could, we got our RT-PCR, we got our tests done, we just ran from Delhi. Lock the house, get out of here. I have not gone back to Delhi, and if I can help it, I'm not going back either, uh, which may not be exactly very practical, in the, but uh, I sort of dug my heels in here now for a while. The, these are things which you... Uh, I fail to understand why do we look at it in simply the compactness and the irrelevance of a small human life. The mountains are so much older. Life has been here for centuries, for whoa, eons. 
and we presume that we are going to change it all. Poverty has to be removed. There's no doubt. Better agriculture has to be come in. And this is a standard statement which goes for every part of the world, which is over 6,000 feet. You have three pillars of your economy, tourism, select horticulture, and uh, hydroelectricity. Throughout the world, these are your pillars which will provide uh, money to the state and to your populace. You have to balance it out. You cannot have the hills ruined. Like with hydro, you know, you raised the point of hydroelectric projects. And we do know that a lot of communities have been affected, you know, they're, um, um, they have been really badly affected by um, uh, hydro projects, because I really feel that people themselves have not been made a part. I, and I also feel Abhimanyu is also here, you know, anthropologists should be a part of the decision making process, the people who live in that area, you know, citizens. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, brought into the picture and these development schemes, you know, they start and, uh, you know, the mafias and all of that goes on. So look at places like Malana and also like developing, uh, you know, Shimla, for example, what it has become today. Uh, what would you uh, like to say about hydropower projects, you know, in this whole region, especially uh, uh, the Rampur area, for example? you know, not too far from Shimla, but uh, it has had such a detrimental effect. So development on one side, but detrimental effect on the people who live in that area. How do we balance that? This, this will, and no matter, this is like a bigger and a wider double-edged sword the way tourism is. It's a double-edged sword. Without it, you cannot raise revenue. With it, you are going to have ecological damage. Like, for example, like the moment you start moving north of Rampur, the river Satluj has more or less vanished. It is a head race tunnel and a tail race tunnel. That's all you have. And uh, local wildlife expectedly has uh, been impacted. On the other side of it is like if you look at, uh, say, what has happened when the coal dam reservoir was built, the amount of compensation which has been paid to the local communities is phenomenal. These people are laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, they're only too happy with it. Uh, but on the other side is that what happened years and years ago along the Pong Dam, the Maharana Pratap Sagar, the Pong Dam Reservoir, even today, and this is something which happened in the 50s and the 60s, the people who are the austies of the Pong Dam were supposed to be given land in Haryana and in Rajasthan. Many of them still haven't got land. We're talking 60 years, seven, that generation is dead. The next generation is preparing to die. And those people have still not been given anything. See, Sonali, this may sound like one is holding forth and one is being very pedantic and all about this, which is not at all my intention. Uh, if you look at it in certain ways, uh, you look at human life on our planet. We estimate the life of our planet to be 4.6 billion years. 4.6 billion ends up having too many zeros and it just becomes a very, it's a number which is very hard to fathom. Let's change that to 46 human years. In 46 human year, years, every sort of human, starting from human, a homo habilis to homo erectus to, uh, to homo sapiens, in 46 years has been on this planet for two hours. The change which we have uh, done to our planet is post the industrial revolution. Two minutes in those 46 years, less than the time I have taken to have this little conversation with you. And we have completely altered the face of this planet. We uh, do not look at ourselves as a species, as custodians, which is, um, that's not to say I'm right and somebody and uh, the other person is wrong. It always has to be about balance. So true. So true that, you know, we don't see ourselves as custodians. And if we did, we wouldn't let this happen. Coming back to uh, you, <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about the hills and the problems that we are facing. And of course it affects us all because we love the mountains so very much. Um, when did you start writing? And what was, what was it that triggered your writing? What was that inspired? <laughs> okay, this is a tough one. <laughs> uh, 
For one is that I was very lucky to have an excellent headmaster when I was in school. He, in many ways, mentored my reading more than anything else. And I was still in school when I got something published in the Commonwealth Students volume, which was a very big thing then. Moved on to college, became the editor of the college magazine and what have you. But at no point of time in my life, did at that, in those years, did I think I would ever take up writing seriously. It would always be, say, something on the side. It is a career which has happened by default and through no choosing of mind. I must add, I actively fought against making it a life. Um, when I was in college, like the many other people in my family, I was off to the US with the, to do an MBA. I got admission in Houston. I got an assistantship. All that part was sorted. And when I was ready to go, one of my aunts said to me, she says, all you youngsters leave and leave us oldies here to die and what have you. So I said, okay, forget it. I'll do something else. I'm sure I can work something else. And I came back to Simla. Needless to say, my father short-circuited. And he says, now what are you going to do? So I took up a job with an advertising agency briefly in Bombay, which used to be OBN then. Now it's back to being ONM, Ogilvy and Matha. At that time, it was Ogilvy, Benson and Matha. And I lasted maybe a week or something there. And back I was. Then... Uh, so the next thing, okay, now what do you do? So everybody sits for the civil services in India. So that's what I shall do. Now, the funny part is, uh, the tough part of things, which is supposedly your written examination, I cleared that and failed the interview, which everybody had thought for you, the interview is a cakewalk. But that's what happened. And I didn't want to appear for it again. Now, the next few years, I can actually take a decade and put it literally in the WC and pull the chain. Uh, those next 10 years were pure hell because I had, without realizing what I had done, closed all those doors. Writing just began to keep my sanity. The first book was picked up by Penguin, which was suddenly this started opening out. And it is almost after that has been a completely organic growth. I have not tried. I have not gone to a publisher. I have been fortunate enough or whatever. So like a good Hindu, I should say Kismat. Uh, but uh, whatever that may mean. But it was never my intention. But now that I look back at it, I am so happy it happened this way. Yeah, what, what is meant to be happens. And I do, I do want to um, interrupt you here because what you talked about the civil services, you know, my father, he was in the Indian Foreign Services and he wanted me uh, to get into the services as well. And I was not the type who would like sit hours together and go to Rao's highest circle and all of that. So I, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to prepare. Uh, Papa, I'm going to prepare. I'm going to go for the state civil services so that I get prepared well. And then I'll try for the civils. So I would go to states, different states. Okay, I would apply. I would never go there to take the exam. I would just go and explore the port, <laughs> the places. I remember going to Shimla also, yeah? yeah. Uh, and I stayed with my aunt and it was raining and she said, it's your exam. I said, I know, I know, but I'm not taking it. <laughs> it's raining. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, I didn't do the civil services <laughs> because I just didn't want to. And uh, I did law instead. And then I ended up in archaeology. So what you said about you know, that, you know, it just happens by default because where you're meant to be, you're meant to be. And that's where you are. So tell us about your first book. So the first book, which is, um, which was the one, which is a history of Simla. Uh, this was at that point of time when I really didn't even know it would ever shape up into a book. I just started collecting notes, going researching. It was, you know, just to keep my mind off things. But gradually it built up into something very substantial. And I must add here that now for the second edition, many of the pictures have come from Hugh Rayner. And I very, I would always acknowledge with gratitude all that he has done in this. So I started off working on that, kept on 
building up. It's sort of shaped up as a manuscript. And then some friends of mine were entering the publishing line. So they said, okay, pass it to us, we'll publish it. Now, this is again, what you say, call it chance, call it whatever. And by then I had started writing fairly regularly for the Times of India. And um, the editor with whom, the senior editor whom I dealt with at that point of time was the famous Jag Suraya. So Jag uh, said that, well, you've, uh, so I spoke to him and uh, he saw the manuscript and he says, what are you doing with this? He says, one is that I want an exclusive and they did a, a full page on the Sunday, an exclusive extract for the, on, for, of the book. He says, what are you doing with it? I said, this is what I'm doing with it. He says, can you hold on for a day? I said, yeah, where I've held on for five years, I'm sure I can hold on for another day. So he said, and the next day he fixed up a meeting with, uh, with uh, uh, David Davidar, who headed Penguin at that time. So I went across, they used to be in the Saftajang development area at that point of time. And I showed him this. He says, yes, thank you. We'd like to publish it. He had spoken to Kushwan Singh that evening and Kushwan Singh took a look at it. He says, yes, we'd like to publish it. And that was my first book and off it went. And it's very interesting that uh, just about anybody whom I contacted uh, and who had a similar connection was more than forthcoming, whether it was in terms of material, whether it was in terms of contacts. To give you an example, I wrote to the novelist MMK, who's famous for the Far Pavilion, Shadow of the Moon and all that, and the care of her publishers, also Penguin in the UK. And uh, so the next thing I knew was this long handwritten letter came back. And that was the start of a very long uh, correspondence by what was then call it snail mail as it's called today. And somewhere along the line, she said, would you like me to write a foreword for this book of yours? I said, well, of course. I mean, what more could I want? And so that came in and well, it did well critically. Books like this and with Indian publishers don't do necessarily do well financially. But other assignments started, they just started flowing in, but they establish an academic credibility. That is the important thing. Then the other things started happening, whether it was TV, whether it was other stuff. So it's been an interesting thing. And again, like I said, it's all been organic. Uh, the walks which I ended, I still do now in Simla. Uh, those started off was because one of my school teachers, Barry Williamson, went back to Bristol and his wife, Sylvia, was bringing in groups from England. So she says, well, would you come and have dinner with our group and would you talk to them about Simla? So the next day, do you think you could go for a little walk with them? And gradually that evolved into becoming walks. So it's and I really all... think this uh, heritage walks is such a beautiful uh, thing. Uh, you've been doing it in Shimla. I started it in Kulu, you know, just uh, researching these areas and walking. And each time I walk, and I'm sure you feel the way, it's like a new story just, you know, comes. And the fact that you can weave a narrative and communicate it, it's so much better than just reading a book, but actually experiencing, taking it to the next level. And I'm so, so happy. I really want to come to Shimla and do a walk with you as well. And all of those who are here, if you go to Shimla, you definitely should do that with Raja Bhaseen. So as um, Sam, Sam Desai has just put up the thing. He's done the walks with both of us. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Sam, I hope you're happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> having done the walks <laughs> so uh, yeah I really feel that uh, doing walks needs a lot of passion for the person who leads it and um, you have that passion for Shimla and, and Simla what um, and and tell us about this Shimla versus Simla what is right is it Shimla or is it Simla tell us uh, in some ways uh, both are right now, if we go in terms of recorded material, the first published uh, mentions which we have go back to the early part of the 19th century, where the two spellings which we get are S-E-M-L-A and S-I-M-L-A. Again, from early English writer, uh, travelers coming to this part of the world. But as you will see in Kulu also, the hills are very soft on the consonants. So the S is pronounced as sh. So in Hindi, it was always Shimla. It was never Simla. 
So while in Hindi, if you wrote a address in Hindi, in Hindi, you would write Shimla. If you wrote it in English, you would write Simla. So in 1982, when it was formally changed to Shimla, unlike many other name changes which have taken place, this one has its validity because it was already in use and in popular use and more people were using it written in Hindi than they were in English. So it's quite all right having it as Shimla, but people like me who have grown up with a particular spelling and pronunciation still end up preferring it to by default as Shimla. Got it. I'm so glad that um, you clarified that. So I'm going to say similar <laughs> now. <laughs> do it the right way. I do want to ask you about, um, you know, the descendants of the British who, uh, you know, still live in uh, similar and, um, uh, you know, their homes and how that whole uh, environment around them changes. Huh? But there is something that still connects them. Uh, tell us about them. Tell us about how the shift, how they took the shift, how their descendants took the shift. You know, their children, their grandchildren, you would have com communicated with them over a period of time. Being in a school also, you know, I'm sure the Irish brothers were running that school, Bishop mm -hmm. Cotton. I don't know. The house was the Church of England. Second. Okay, St. Edward's was Irish brothers, right? So tell us about that. Tell us about, uh, you know, them. Uh well, one is Sonali, which um, very few people actually realize. Unlike many other towns in, in India, like say, for example, Calcutta, uh, Mumbai, even say Uti, Kanur, or Masuri, or even Darjeeling for that matter, Simla had a very tiny population of Europeans as permanent residents. This was an appointment town. People came here as a part of the government or as a part of the military. They served their tenure here and they left. So a long-term connection was limited to a very few families. People were here only for maybe four or five years and off they went. Maybe a son would come in later or a grandson would come in later. That would be a separate issue. But the number of businessmen, which would be only, which would be traders really in this part, there were no tea planters, there were no industrialists. So if you had tea, uh, traders, shopkeepers basically, there were a few well settled English shopkeepers. And Simla at that point of time was a very cosmopolitan town. There was a huge Bengali community, a huge uh, Maharashtrian community, Armenians, Parsis apart from the, the English, the Welsh, and the Irish, and the Scots. Because uh, if you start breaking it up, you will find that the English were the ones who ran the army, but it was the Scots who ran the government. Uh, if you just, you just have to read a civil list to see the difference very clearly. Now, 1947 is the big change which takes place where uh, so many of these people leave Simla. But again, many of them, they spent their time here in Simla and off they went to wherever their next posting was. Now, of those families, it's a very interesting movement which starts taking place. It's an angular movement. Remember the time when they go back to uh, Britain and not just England, it's Britain in general, especially the greater London area. The we are talking about post Second World War Brit uh, England. It's a, it's a country which has been ravaged by the Second World War. London is a pile of rubble in many ways. Uh, there is rationing, there are shortages. Here were these people very used to opulent colonial lifestyles. A dozen servants, a man to do this, so somebody to do that. When they went back to Britain, it was a shock to them suddenly to deal with living in a cramped space uh, with all these problems. Many of them simply couldn't take it. Now, many of these people started moving to the remnants of the old colonies in Africa. A large movement started taking place to Africa. Another movement started taking place to Canada and to Australia in the 50s and the 60s, where many of these families have finally settled after leaving uh, uh, Britain. The coming back to Simla, the next major change which actually impacted this town even more severely was not the leaving of the Europeans, it was the building of Chandigarh and the Punjab government moving out. 
Now suddenly the town moved into a cold storage. To give you again an example, real estate values plummeted. Say something, if, say a house which was worth maybe a hundred rupees in the 1920s, in the 1950s, it had dropped to 20 rupees. That is how much the crash was. For many people that this town is over, there's nothing here. The only thing which kept this town going was the, uh, the arrival of the Western Command of the Army and its educational institutions. That was pretty much it. So yes. have, you, have you been in conversation uh, with uh, you know, families who um, occupied uh, these homes, the beautiful British styled homes, um, and um, how you know, it, it has so much of influence on the landscape of a place. And you see so many of them being like demolished and all these hotels being built and uh, all of that. So uh, what is your uh, idea of uh, all of see, these things is... that Shimla has witnessed? Uh, at one level, it is tragic seeing all these beautiful houses being knocked down, all these gorgeous old bungalows gradually fading away. But as a colonial town, its reasons for being were as a capital. And uh, I may add here that while it is referred to as a summer capital, for all practical purposes, this was the true capital of India because the government moved here in late March, early April, and stayed here till late October, early November, going to Calcutta and later New Delhi only for the winter months. Eight months, the government was in this tiny little village up on a hilltop. Uh, and some of the events which have taken place here impact our lives to the present day. Uh, I'll come to that if you like. But coming back to your original question, the reasons for those houses has gone. The people who occupied those houses are gone. At one point of time, Simla was a place of opportunity, opportunity for career advancement. And it was said that this town has, um, you know, it has more scandals and the sound of grinding axes keeps everybody awake at night because everybody was pushing for advancement. This was the place of opportunity. It was a Mecca, if you will. Now, suddenly that Mecca shifted out. Uh, it just shut down. Now it has become a place of a, opportunity for a different sort. Hoteliers, middle-class tourists. And this tourism, unbridled, unchecked tourism is going to be the bane, not just of Simla, but of the entire Himalayan chain. If it is not arrested, uh, and it cannot be arrested by legislation. It has to be a, 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 by me market mechanisms. It is going to very severely and negatively impact both the tourism industry in the long run, as well as the environment. There is this. Now, there are so many of these people who come into Simla looking for jobs. Many of them about, like, say, Two in five people in Simla are directly or indirectly connected with the government. Either they're direct employees of the government or they've got something or the other to do with the government. Uh, so once they retire, very often they, they like to settle here. The children are going to school here. They're looking for jobs for their children again in the same setup. But on the other hand, this is something which is one of the big reasons for the prosperity of Himachal is that many of the government employees return to their villages and the pensions are repatriated to their villages, which has accounted very substantially for rural prosperity in our state. Uh, yes, talking about rural prosperity, I do want to share, you know, like 25 years ago when I was much younger and I would hike, uh, you know, into the mountains, I used to visit the Theog region a lot. When I used to be on the ridge, there's this mountain peak I think it's the highest peak, Charlie Tibba. And I just had this desire to go. And I would just go off and just uh, stay in these villages and make friends. And I befriended these families and they would come to Delhi and they were this exchange of culture. And 25 years later, I went back to the village and I was shocked because the development was so, so uh, pronounced that I still remember the two hour trek from the forest to these villages. And now there was a road and um, 
the house was of concrete and gone was that wooden house that I would look at and you know I would just like feel so happy that it's so Himalayan like all these changes happen so prosperity yes and then always this prosperity is equated with this concrete buildings and structures and that is changing the face of the mountains right so um, what do you have to say about that hopefully that is a cycle which will gradually start turning backwards uh, to um, sort of clarify to sort of add a little to what you just said is that um, when uh, india got independence 1947 the Himachal's territory was not its present territory. It was just about 22,000 square kilometers. And you had one pocket here. Then you had a pocket of Punjab. Kulu, and Kulu for example, was in Punjab then. And then you had Chamba, which was a part of Himachal. So there was this Punjab territory of Kangara and uh, Kulu, which was dividing the state. So that the territory overall was 22,000 square kilometers. Today, it is roughly about 57,000 square kilometers. Now, at the time when it had those 22,000 kilometers, the total length of motorable road in Himachal was 34 miles. Uh, uh, even the Kalka Simla road was a part of Punjab at that point of time. From 34 miles, we are today at over 42,000 kilometers within a single generation that geographical isolation has simply gone. Every house has electricity. Almost every house has potable water. Uh, your internet and your telephone connections have just overtaken everything. Concrete, unfortunately, has been equated with uh, prosperity. Pakka ghar, uh, that this is, we have a pakka ghar and that means we are sort of like, we've moved on a step. To give you one thing that will gain on one of my wanderings, this is a good 20 years ago or so, one of the most beautiful pockets of Himachal is this village of Janjheli. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's in the Mandi district. So when I went there, at, uh, there was only one ghastly looking structure made of concrete, which was the Yuko Bank. The rest of the village was all these wood slate houses, absolutely delightful. In many ways, it was like what Kulu must have been 40 years ago. Uh, but it didn't have such a big river, which has a small stream. Now, this man who I was having in the Dhaba, the, where I was eating, so he pointed out this gorgeous double-storied wooden house. And he says, I'm going to build it to pull it down and I'm going to make something like this concrete building because this in his mind's eye was what he felt tourists wanted. This is what he felt travelers wanted. So it took, I don't know what he's done then, but what I and the person with me tried to explain, keep the house. What you need is a clean, efficient kitchen and a clean, efficient bathroom. These are the only two things which you need. Otherwise, of course, good housekeeping and all that has to be there. But this is the character. You remove, say, the built character. You remove the heritage. You remove the natural beauty. What do you have? I so subscribe to this because this is exactly what I talk about, that the facade of the house should be the same, the character, the identity, because if it becomes the same, then who's going to come? You know, we've got these forest parts being replaced by concretized parts and these houses, you know, like especially in Kulu, they uh, copy the Kartkuni kind of architecture with the tiles. But, you know, it's concrete. And I always say these beautiful Kartkuni homes, you know, you just make a good bathroom inside and a kitchen. And because you also have a right to develop and change, but don't change the facade. Don't change that beauty that, you know, is not nowhere to be seen. And this is what's so special about, and I always say, oh, it's something's wrong with our aesthetics. What happened to the Indian aesthetic? Right. Now, this is a very tricky one. Like, um, and I put it a little, little more bluntly, uh, is that if you look at so many of our temples, our beautiful wooden slate temples right across uh, Himachal, they were beautifully preserved by default because nobody had any money. The moment money has arrived, they have started resembling, I'm sorry to put it so crudely, but that's the way I feel. They have started resembling public toilets. Oh my the same God. marble, <laughs> the same quota stone, the same bathroom tiles. The tiles. Whatever for. Uh, I mean, this is, this is absurd. The intrinsic character of that place, you're destroying it. 
And this was all being preserved by default because there was no money. Now there's money, where do you spend it? So this is the easiest thing to do. The next thing you know is all those, go I've seen it. Those beautiful carvings have been uh, uh, covered over with plaster, with covered over with uh, tiles. I, but I, in the long run, how, if you look at, uh, again, this is a something, it's a little perspective that I have. If you look at it in world terms, what is unique about India? Let's compare it with any other country. Let's take, take a random example. Uh, let's compare it with what? Australia, say. Uh, or any other country for that matter, is that there will always be a better airport. There, the odds are it will always be a be, 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 be better airport. There may be better hotels. This is something which is standard across the world. That's not to say that we should have dirty toilets and dirty and inefficient airports. You must have them. What is it that is unique about our country? It is our culture. It is the fact that we are the world's oldest unbroken civilization. We have 5,000 years of building history and culture within our, us. Which other country has this? Uh, we may have overlaid it in multiple ways, but this will always be something unique to India. And this is something which we must, at least to my mind, strive to preserve. This is our identity. Uh, you'll find tiles and concrete any part of the world. You'll find corrugated iron in every part of the world. In the 1860s, when corrugated iron was first manufactured uh, uh, in, a, in, in, in an industrial way, it overtook the world. It appeared in every single one of the colonies. It replaced all the, the slate and wood shingle roofs in the hills. There has to be that balance. You cannot deprive people of better livelihoods. You cannot deny them better lives simply on your point of view that my aesthetic is getting disturbed. Therefore, you must live in a filthy old house. That's not right. Where's the balance? And the, some mechanism has to be created we, our country, may not be able to create that mechanism of, say, the what the National Trust has. In uh, I've lost you. Can others hear? Okay, I think we've lost he, him. We've lost him. Yeah. We've lost him. Yeah, I think he'll be back. So let's just wait patiently. Sorry, I think my yeah, I think everything we, is froze. <laughs> we lost you for a bit. But yes, yeah. you're right. You know, we are experiencing the same thing in Lahol Spiti, where the vernacular housing is being changed to concrete because now the tunnel is made. And you're so right about balance that, you know, what we think should not be imposed, but the, the, uh, the wishes of the people. And when I go around villages, I ask them, they do like, they love wooden homes, but then they're not reasonably available because they're so, so expensive and they can't afford to make wooden houses. And uh, so they, uh, you know, turn out to make concrete, which comes out uh, much cheaper. And then, of course, there's a lot of corruption uh, with the forest officers and all of that. So you're right. There's so many things to it. So as I was going through your book list, um, and I'll just read out a few titles. And all of you here, uh, you should get these. They're all available on Amazon. Shimla, the summer capital of British India. Shimla on foot. Easy trails around Shimla. Flowerwoods Hotel, the toy train, who hasn't been to Shimla, you know, on the Kalka Shimla uh, toy train, experience Himachal on the road, some memorials and burials in Shimla, and so on and so forth. What is your favorite book? And I do want to ask you, you know, my friend Kelvin is here. Kelvin is from the Netherlands, and he and I have been in touch with um, uh, uh, John Nankiewicz. Uh, who uh, illustrated with uh, Penelope Shetwood. Uh, and she went on these mules uh, to write her uh, very famous book, Kulu, uh, The End of the Inhabitable World. 
So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about your favorite book and whether you ever got a chance to meet Penelope Chetwood or John Nankiewicz. Uh, unfortunately, I never got to meet them. I think there was a bit of an age difference at that point of time. But uh, who's a very dear friend is uh, Paddy Singh, who conducted the tours which uh, uh, Penelope Chetwood and uh, John Ankivel took. So he's a good friend and there's a fair bit of information of, of all that which I've got from him. And talking about a favorite book, I don't think I have any. It would be like, you know, this is an old one. It's nothing very original that I'm coming out with. But you don't say that this is my favorite child. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to skip this one. <laughs> But, but the book that really, um, you know, made you like realize that, oh my God, Shimla is so much more than I ever knew. What was that? You know, the whole process of research, like what, what was that moment where you said, oh my God, I didn't know this. And now I'm knowing this, you know, there's so many yeah, times I like don't that. Know, somewhere along the line, it happens when you're researching. I won't say there was ever a Eureka moment, but uh, it was, I think, just a little process, which you keep on working on. And uh, like this one, which I'm working now on the partition, on partition, uh, it's material, it's unwieldy. I don't know what it's going to be like. I have no idea where it's going to go. And that's the same thing which happened with, say, any of the other books. I had no idea where they were finally going to go, except the commissioned books, where, say, the Himachal Tourism commissioned me to do something specific. And I followed a, a sort of like a set plan. But for the others, it's again, like the rest of, I would say, a lot of my life, very organic. Um, I have a dear friend who was a civil servant. Uh, he lives in Abbottabad now. He's a professor of English. His father was uh, Sik Sikandar Hayatarin. Uh, uh, Sikandar Hayat Khan. Uh, yeah. So he's from the Tarin kind of clan. And I think he was, I'm not, I'm, I do not remember correctly, but he was in the first government that was made pre-partition. See, sir, 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 Sikandar Hayat Khan was a very influential Muslim politician at that point of time. Now, if you look back into history, uh, the elections which took place after the act of 1935, the Congress actually won most of the seats in what is today's uh, Punjab in undivided Punjab. It was the Congress which won there. The Muslim League actually won mostly in what is Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and the Bengal area. That was the pocket where the Muslim League won. The other influential party in the Northwest, in this part of the world, in North India, was the Unionist Party, which was again headed by numerous Punjabi Muslim landlords. So Sikandar Hayat Khan was a very influential man in that party. So, and, and, and his um, uh, son sent a photograph of his mother looking at their home in Shimla after partition. And, um, you know, we can just see the back, her back, and she's looking at her home. And that moment that moment is so deep and so, and I'm sure, you know, you may have encountered so many moments in the book that you're writing on the partition of revisiting your ancestry, of revisiting what was yours. And for us, for you and I, with that Meerpur connection, I remember I was in this uh, uh, platform called Clubhouse and everybody was talking about Jammu people and Kashmiri earth and all of that. They're debating over, we've lost our identity. And then I just spoke in between. I said, you know, you have that land, you're, you have Kashmir, you have Srinagar, you have Jammu and look at us, that occupied region, it's under damn waters. We can't, we have to like scuba dive to get there. It's not even there, but we still have that identity. You can still have that identity and go on. So everybody was just quiet. <laughs> and that was a Meerpuri talking, you know, <laughs> with all her heart. Well, um, Sunadi, I'm sitting right now in my dining room and mm -hmm. one of the pictures on our walls is the photograph of our um, house in Lahore, which my father put up here. Really? I can put it up quickly and show it to you if yes, you want. Yes, please do, please do. 
And as you're bringing it, I, you know, I have these um, uh, uh, pebble stones that my fa father has from Mirpur. And uh, he always had him uh, by his bedside and uh, till his death. And now I am the bearer of the pebble stones from uh, Mirpur. That is the only tangible thing that I can hold and keep that speaks of my identity. And I'm so proud of being a Mirpuri. Good. So this is the photograph, if you can see it. Oh, beautiful. So uh, does the house uh, still in exist? In Lahore. In, this still... is the house, my grandfather's house in Lahore. Does it still exist? Yes. Though I believe some friends have gone and visited it. My father got numerous opportunities. He says, I'm not going. Oh. I have beautiful memories. I want to leave it at that. Yes, I can totally understand that. So, yes, this has been such a beautiful journey of, you know, talking about your childhood, about the changes in Shimla. And I feel now that, uh, uh, you know, we've completed an hour. I do want to open up the forum so that others who are listening to us and who may have, you know, wonderful questions can pose them to you and we can continue. Um, of course, if you have time, we can continue uh, with you answering um, questions about Simla, about you, about your work. Um, Certainly. So, yes. Should we keep do. it for about 10 minutes or so? 10, 15, 10 minutes or so? Yes, yes, 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah. So, uh, all of you who are here, please raise your hands and uh, you can just come in and uh, ask questions. And um, while they are thinking about the question, I do want to uh, order your books for my library in uh, uh, Kulu. And of course, you have to come. Um, I'm in this little village called Jonga. Uh, where we have a presiding deity, Bhaga Siddhi, and um, you are welcome to come and, um, uh, you know, visit and see what, and be my guest there. Thank you so much. And yeah. let me extend the offer to Simla too. Thank you. So don't we have any questions? Doesn't anybody want to go to Simla? Abhimanyu, I can see Abhimanyu has raised his hand. Okay, I couldn't see him on the screen. Okay, Abhimanyu, go for it. Uh, firstly, uh, thanks, uh, Raja sir, for this wonderful talk. I mean, you are, of course, a monumental personality in the public consciousness of Himachal Pradesh and have played a very, very important role in uh, raising uh, reading culture in the state. So firstly, uh, thank you for your contribution to our state. Um, I have one question, and this is regarding a question that particularly rose up in Europe in the aftermath of the pandemic. And here were a lot of opinion pieces about the nature of tourism and a lot of people in Europe were actually quite happy that tourism was subsiding in places like Barcelona, in many places like Vienna, etc. And there were some opinion pieces that said that tourism should not be seen as an ordinary livelihood or as an ordinary right belonging to everyone. Tourism is essentially a luxury because you place as a visitor a lot of demands on whichever environment, whichever locale you are going to, so you should be ready to invest in that environment. What would you have to comment upon that? Do you think that uh, a place should be open to receiving everyone as visitors or only to people who have the means to kind of properly pay for the services that they get at a locality, in, particularly in relation to the Himalayas? Uh, Abhimanyu, this is again like what I sometimes use this phrase a little too often, a double-edged sword. You can prove this argument either way. You can spin it either way. One is that why should somebody be denied the, the pleasure or the privilege or the right to visit a portion of his own country? Let's start with that before we go into international travel. If I, as a person from Himachal, wish to visit Tamil Nadu, why should I be denied the right to do so? Uh, at one level, it promotes uh, your nation building. It promotes a greater understanding of cultures, but at the same time can also create local resentment as well as resentment on part of the traveler who feels he's being sh uh, shortchanged or whatever. In a country, I have worked extensively on this, uh, that, and I just noticed a comment here, and I'd like to take this up because this is where, what I was coming to. In the analysis of uh, market economies within, especially in rural areas, the percolation, what we have found of uh, backpackers 
in the local economy is far more than that of high-end tourists. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, you have a fancy hotel, say, in Simla, where most of your products and most of your, say, your, what you will serve is outsourced. What you will be sourcing locally is perhaps um, meat to an extent, and that also not the processed meat or the even, say, bacon, you will be getting some from somewhere else. Some vegetables, some milk. Beyond that, your consumption of the, from the local market is minimal. On the other hand, a backpacker staying in a village for a month will perhaps be putting in more into the local economy than that what is happening in, the, in a five-star hotel. The multiplier effect of that is considerably more. The multiplier effect can work up to one to three of these, this local economy. Uh, what does not work is the mass driven tourism, what we sometimes refer to as the Chana Batura tourism. That the, he's going to come here, he's going to eat there, he's going to mess up the place, he's going to booze up in the thing, have a fight, and off he goes. Uh, it costs us more in terms of civic services, it costs us more in terms of law and order than what do we gain. At many levels, tourism, if it does not benefit the host community, it's of no benefit to anybody. That should be a benchmark, the host community and the host environment. If it benefits it, yes, go for it. If it does not benefit it, don't go for it. And within that, you need to create, again, your checks and balances. I'll give you one personal example. Uh, this is several years ago uh, that I and a friend of mine, we were going up into towards Spiti, which you are so familiar with. And this is long ago. And uh, so we were driving and there was a group of foreigners, I will not say the nationality, that is not appropriate, of foreigners who were uh, on motorcycles. And they had two trucks on which the motorcycles would be loaded and then they would off-road on uh, uh, various places and do all their driving and all that there. And there were a couple of backup Jeeps with all their stuff. Uh, so we would uh, be sometimes ahead of them, sometimes behind them. In that week or so of our sort of crisscrossing each other, not once did I see them or anybody buy anything from the local market. Uh, not, a, not a vegetable, not a cup of tea, nothing. At Rangrik, which you know, they had camped overnight. We were driving across and going over the Kunzam. Uh, somehow people feel when they come to India, they are also entitled to litter. All what was left there was litter. What did we get? The garbage to pick up. That's mm. all we got out of it. Now that is something which is unacceptable. Why, uh, you come to my home and you dirty it up and I'm supposed to say thank you. Mm -hmm. That's not on. Uh, but this thing, this homestay, which started as a very minor experiment, has boomed. And the pandemic has been a major driver for this. I know of friends, family who've got places. They are full. People just want to get away. And the internet, working from home, as you are doing, as I am doing, has completely changed our work styles. And which has made the hills so much more accessible, but fortunately in whatever little I have seen, it's been made accessible to a far more caring and sensitive uh, lot of people who genuinely care for the hills. They are not here to uh, 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 sort of run away and uh, clear out the place out. So I hope that answers my point of view, my little point of view, uh, Abhimanyu. new. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. If only homestays, the whole idea would have been kind of it had some rules and regulations that keep the facade, change the toilet, and you know you will be given us you know uh, more um, yeah, you know whatever by the government. Uh, that was not done. You know, just doing it like that. You know, it creates a boom, See, but then it's it, it was. This is again like something because when it started as a scheme within the government. I was assisting the government at that point of time when the tourism policy was being drafted. 
and we really didn't expect it to take off the way it has. And the pandemic is largely responsible for this. Till that time, they, you see, they, they were incentivized. You would get uh, little things in rural tourism. You would be given uh, uh, water and electricity at domestic rates. There was a little subsidy given to you to fix your place up. Many people did that. But then suddenly it just it skyrocketed. And uh, it has benefited numerous people whom I know who were on the edge of starvation. Uh, their farms were not yielding enough. The land was not enough, but they are doing very well today. At least, if not very well, they are at least making both ends meet. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so, if I may, uh, Sonaliji, if you are okay, can I share one example of a very good experiment from Speaky on homestays? Of course, of course, please do. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Radhaji, you must have been to Demul also in Spiti, mm -hmm. uh, high up on the plateau. So, at Demul, uh, this uh, NGO called Ecosphere, about uh, 15 years ago, they started this experiment where there are about 15 house, 50, 50, 50 households in Demul, all built in the local uh, rammed earth architecture. And uh, they said that uh, we shall start a rotational system of uh, homestays here. So, for example, say two families of tourists come to stay at this village. So, they will stay in household number one. After that, if there are two more families come, they'll go to household number two. They will not stay in the additional rooms of household one. And so on and so forth. So that everybody, and say now these four go away. Now another set of tourists come. They will not go to houses one and two. They will go to household three and four. So that way the entire village gets to share a certain number of households. And a certain percentage of the income earned by every household goes to a common fund in the village so that the entire village is kind of earning. So I talked to some villagers from Demul and they said the only reason why, unlike other villages in, in Spiti, like uh, Kibber or uh, Kaza, etc., where there is a much more commercial form of homestay business, the only reason why in Demul most people still have a traditional architecture at 4,200 meters is that nobody has the incentive to build a better homestay because everybody gets a chance nonetheless to have people stay over at their place. Of course, they have a certain basic minimum standard of having toilets and so forth at each of the homestays. But nonetheless, it does not depend upon a homestay having a pakka exterior to invite tourists because the village itself has a system of regulating where the tourist goes to. So it's not up to the tourist to decide at which home he wants to live or she wants to live. It's the villagers that decide that which house today will the tourist get allotted to. So that way the entire village gets to benefit from the tourism and the local architecture has also as a side effect gotten preserved. Okay. Thank you. We are just uh, taking it. This is a wonderful example of what cooperation can create and is also a perfect example of saying self-regulation ends up becoming perhaps the best form of regulation. Uh, this, is, this is voluntary. It hasn't been imposed by anybody. And if it's working, it would be actually an ideal model. But unfortunately, this may work in a traditional small community. But in larger players, you will have to deal with the capitalist, the more incentivized, the more commercial people who are going to enter the markets, whether you like it or you don't. Absolutely. So true. And let's take the last question because I know it's dinner time for everyone. Uh, Shubhadeep, uh, uh, Raja, he's, a, uh, he's an architect. He's a regular on our forum. Shubhadeep, over to you. Yeah, hi, uh, Sonali and uh, Mr. Basin. It was, uh, it's really uh, very exciting to hear uh, someone who's based out of Simla and has been a part of the development program. You know, I mean, you were an advisor to the Himachal government, uh, that's what you said. So uh, my only question that I want to raise here is that, uh, you know, the, there are new areas that are opening up in Himachal Pradesh. Uh, so are there any new regulations that are being initiated from the government side so that as Sonali has been constantly pointing out, that you know uh, the 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 uh, the the look and feel, okay, in a in a very simple rudimentary form, I would like to put it, 
the look and feel of the village is retained mm. right and also it is made accessible by road and you know quote and quote development takes place no problem with that but the look and feel of the village is retained and that is going to be something which is a genuine usp which they can exploit and there have been some villages in uttarakhand and other areas you know where uh, this look and feel thing has been exploited and uh, people are going and as you correctly pointed out that sensitive people are actually going there and helping promote their uh, promote and retain their culture and their uh, you know aesthetics and ethics and all that so is is government uh, trying to help in that direction see shubhadeep this is a, this is a yes and a no answer for this okay. the yes is that on paper regulations are coming in but the implementation as you know in our country are the way they are they are okay i live without uh, explaining that very much further uh certain things are coming up for example the ngt the national green tribunal has given this instructions that more than two and a half stories will not be permitted in certain areas so these huge concrete structures hopefully will no longer come but we cannot make any uh, statement on that without knowing any better and uh, like say let's take a case of jnk in jammu and kashmir especially kashmir why do are the houses still built in traditional ways the one simple reason you still have woodworking skills and the wood is cheap if the wood becomes cheap all over again or commercial wood is made available again you will start seeing those things why are concrete houses being built today the basic reason is that it is cheaper to make it lasts longer if you can reverse that cycle and because the this thing is now we are no longer talking about sustainability we are in a post sustainable world we have to look at post sustainability that part of uh, human history or development is fairly over now we need to look at what is going to keep us going as even as human beings uh that having been said uh, from intac we did a very detailed project report on a village if you've ever heard of the name called nirmand Nirmand is one of the most uh, uh, historical villages anywhere in our country and one of the world our country's oldest extant land records is what is called the Nirmand copper plate which was of land grants it is a village still substantially populated only by brahmins because it goes back it's very it's a long story which i can't go into given the time we have uh, connected with the legend of bhagwan parshuram now we did a uh, uh, intact prepared a detailed project report of village revival and a village related tourism policy so the entire village was mapped out these 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 are the historical structures which need to be completely preserved in their entirety these 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 require modifications this is going to be your parking this area is going to be paved this area is going to remain natural so it becomes a, a an integrated thing which is done with the community's involvement so the the stakeholders are both ways if something like that ever if we are, if we get it off the ground i think will be something which should uh, pave the, be an indicator of the way to, uh, things uh, can be done well to an extent i hope that answers your question shubhadeep yes it does in fact uh, it does actually uh, you know i am from a college which actually professor menon was the director so intac and all that you know <laughs> we are quite uh, used to hearing the different uh, you know dimensions that they give but the only thing that i wanted to ask is we have excellent examples in bhutan you know how they sort of went about their development and they have been able to retain the character Uh, same thing i wanted to know that now since whatever has been done has been done in mass in himachal uh, what can be the next step forward where regulations are set forth because the tourism industry is definitely happening and with the home stays and other things you know that you initiated it's really happening in the right direction and we need to give it further uh, nudge to go towards what is the the best solution and not something which is um, i know, would totally rudimentary solution i totally agree yeah. with you on this 
But when we give the example mm. of Bhutan and we look at um, gross national happiness instead of the gross national product, we must keep in mind that India is a very diverse country. The pulls and pressures of this country are very different to that of Bhutan. Bhutan is a tiny, uh, homogeneous uh, country, which uh, is gives certain importance to certain to certain aspects of human life, which is not necessarily the case in a huge country like ours with its different pulls and pushes. Uh, we don't have what sometimes I use the phrase, the McDonaldization of India, where everything is sort of flattened out to become a consistent whole. Uh, it doesn't exist. It's unlikely to exist. But that is what makes us so distinct is our remarkable plurality and the way we still sort of uh, move on doing things. As is sometimes said, that if you look at, uh, and I'm talking about the country as a whole, not just Himachal, if one thing holds to, true for India, the exact opposite holds equally true. If India is poor, it's also extremely wealthy. If there is poverty here, there's also great uh, uh, wealth. So it holds gold in more ways than one. Well, Sonali, yep. I think yeah. one can call it, Let's a, call it a day. Let's you. call it a day. Thank and you. before you leave, yep. just leave us with words of wisdom. That's the tradition here. Uh, we have a lot of people who are from Shimla here. We've got Molly here, Molly, uh, Dr. Molly Kaushal, um, um, who is also from Shimla, and so many others. I may. I I'm wanted people. to thank. I wanted to thank uh, uh, Raja Basin for taking me back to my childhood. Uh, I, my, I, I spent my entire childhood in Shimla and, uh, you know, all that you were talking about, you know, traveling, trekking, the fires, the tourists. I remember even in the seventies, you know, early seventies, then when we were little conscious and we'll have these tourists coming in and I, we always felt a little restrained and we, as kids, you know, we'll play pranks with the tourists. And I, was, I kind of realized later that there was a kind of resentment even at that time, even as a child of others coming. And we felt that they were really kind of, you know, doing things to our places, which would ruin them forever. I don't know where that wisdom came from, why we were so resistant to it. But when I listen to your talk now and I go back to my early childhood, you know, it's, uh, I've read your books. In fact, I think my first introduction to your work was when you did that book on Shimla architecture for Ministry of Culture. And somehow that book landed on my table. And uh, that's been many, many years ago and wonderful meeting you on this platform and a very wonderful talk. In fact, about the homestays, I'm now doing this uh, project on mapping uh, village India culturally. And, uh, you know, I, I really want people like that to become a part of it because one of the proposals was really to, you know, look at these villages in terms of where homestays can be developed. If the villagers would be interested in offering such spaces or whether that kind of infrastructure can be proposed to state governments. I hope that it, the project, you know, how ministry projects move but if it really moves in that direction, I think advi advisors like you would be an asset to, 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 to this project. So I'm really happy that I, I, I am today listening to this talk and I'm on. So thank you both to Raja Basin and to Sonali. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so Thank let you. us usher you for dinner. But before you go, your words of wisdom for all of us. What should your audience take from your talk today? Let's party. <laughs> Let's party. <laughs> and leave it at that. <laughs> Let's party at... and conserve our heritage. <laughs> no, I, I, I have no words of wisdom to give. <laughs> Uh, this is something which I, I mean, I think is extremely presumptuous on my part to try and say that I can give words of wisdom. Uh, but let me repeat what my father used to tell us do good, be good, work hard, and leave, leave it at that. So, hear that, absorb that, and work on that. So, with that, uh, let's call it off and uh, call it a day this wonderful, engaging talk. 
with uh, Raja Bhaseen. And I hope you can come back to the forum and talk about little things on Shimla that you have uh, uh, you know, written in your books and you can share with all of us. And hoping to meet you real soon. And we'll meet you all next week with another evening of a talk. And um, all of you have a great Sunday night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.